April 30th, 1994, Imola, Italy. Roland Ratzenberger pilots his purple Simtech F1 car, complete with MTV sponsor logo, around the Imola circuit during Saturday's qualifying session. The young Austrian driver was excited to be competing in his second Grand Prix appearance. As the TV cameras focus on Damon Hill's run for pole position, the feed is interrupted by images of the purple Simtech Ford, now ravaged by crash damage, slowly sliding to a stop at the apex of the iconic Tosa corner. Track stewards throw red flags, signifying the end of the session, as first responders struggle to get Roland out of his race car. The commentators, in a vain attempt to turn attention away from the crash, discuss the current qualifying lineup. Ferrari's Gerhard Berger in third, Benetton's young gun Michael Schumacher in second, and the mythic Ayrton Senna on pole. As Roland is taken away in an ambulance, the first responders already know that Ratzenberger is dead. What they didn't know is he wouldn't be the only casualty that weekend. On today's Pass Gas, it's Senna Part 4. That yeah. car is so sick. It's really tight. It's such a uh, cool livery. It's a Mugen car, too. Uh, uh, yeah. So, welcome back to Pass. We all knew this was coming. Yeah. I yeah. mean, yeah. I've definitely, I mean, if you guys are out there, you definitely hear the, like, deafening silence. There's not a whole lot of, like, hey, welcome, <laughs> which is, like, what, <laughs> how I would describe our normal sense of humor and energy. I think yep. this is, like, one of the saddest events in all of motorsport and there's been a few of them um so i'm looking forward to telling this story but i'm not looking forward to the way that it makes me feel it's definitely uh something i've not been looking forward to throughout this whole series but uh it's i mean everyone already knows how it ends already so it's gonna be a tough one to get through i think so uh anyway welcome <laughs> welcome back to pass gas everyone uh, I am your host, Nolan Sykes, along with my co-hosts, James Pumphrey Ooh. and Joe Weber. I'm, I'm going to forego my catchphrase this week just uh, as a tribute to Senna. Man, I don't feel you like... You should have discussed like that I'm, with me. Then we could all forego our catchphrases. Now I look... <laughs> now you like, look like an yeah. asshole. <laughs> <laughs> Which is your plan. <laughs> You're, you're the freaking prost of this podcast, dude. Uh, <laughs> the, the professor. professor. <laughs> Except hey, we Nol said that at the same time. I'd say Nolan's the Senna. And, what? Or maybe I'm Senna and Nolan's <laughs> Schumacher. Yeah, I'll take it. Like, ultimately, Nolan will end up being more successful <laughs> than me. But I'll probably die soon. Soon? <laughs> you're doing great. You're healthy. What are you talking about? Yeah, man. I don't know, man. <laughs> it's been a year. Here we are in June. Feeling great. I believe it is week 13 of quarantine for me and you guys as well. Um, yeah, no, Joe and I both live with our girlfriends. Nolan lives alone. Nolan, yeah. would you like your house to be haunted or would you still be scared? <laughs> like, Would you appreciate the company of a ghost or would you <laughs> not? You know, I think it'd be kind of cool, actually. Like, I think at this point... I think it'd be cool just to like kind of hang out, have someone to talk to, maybe, maybe reflect on a lot of things, maybe try to educate said ghost. Maybe he could give me he or she. I don't even know. Do ghosts have gender? I don't think so. Um, well, okay. What if it's, yeah. what if it's um, a girl ghost and it has a huge crush on you? Oh, <laughs> um, but she's like respectful about it. Like she doesn't like watch you in the shower or anything. I was going to say, yeah, yeah. that like, Better not be pulling that. She doesn't put any pressure on you to like date or anything because she doesn't want to ruin your friendship. But it's like, well, also we live together too. That'd just yeah. be really awkward. Like if yeah, I said no, it's awkward. Yeah, that'd be, yeah. But she would bring you flowers and then realize that like once she touches the flowers, she kills them. Yeah. Whoa! And then get really sad and awkward about it. Yeah. Does that mean if she touches me, she kills me too? No, just like no, no. Oh, thank like God. Flowers or like a fern. Like if she touches a fern immediately it just closes up damn turns yeah. black and then into Ooh. ash her name's like elizabeth turner or yeah <laughs> yeah and she uh we have to go find her burial site in a well 
and then she'll stop hunting you. And then when you tell her about The Witcher, she like pretends to be interested, but she <laughs> has no idea what video games are yeah. or a TV is. Yeah, and she like <laughs> wants yeah. to play video games with you, but every time you hand her the controller, it just falls to the ground. And then she gets really oh. embarrassed. It like drains the battery, so you're like, oh, now I can't even play. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, we're in a good mood. Let's start Yeah, let's this. get into it. <laughs> yeah, I woke up this morning. I was like not looking forward to this. I went and I looked myself in the mirror and I said, James, you're going to be in a good mood. You're going to do a good job. You're going to pump the other guys up. They're going to do good jobs. We're going to entertain the people. We're going to bring joy to the masses and then we're going to crush it. Let's amen. Without further ado, this is the final part in our four part series on Ayrton Senna. Let's do it. Senna's career trajectory mirrored his style on the track, explosive and relentless. As a teenager and young man, he was fast out the gate, dominating karting, Formula Ford, and Formula 3, soon reaching the pinnacle of his sport as a Formula 1 driver for McLaren. His ascent through the ranks of racing seemed effortless, aided by his unique twin attributes, a brilliant acumen for driving combined with utter fearlessness. Intelligence and bravery together, the head and the heart working as one. Hell yeah. Yeah. Fire it up. Fire yeah, it up. There it is. Me. Yeah, Joe. That's what I'm talking <laughs> about, bud. <laughs> the head and Once the heart Senna sounds like an e like a um like an alt country like band. Sounds oh, like totally. a sounds like, like a Neil Young song. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Once Senna reached the top, he stayed there. In 1988, 1990, and 1991, he was the Formula One world champion. Many argue that 89 should have been his as well. By 92, at only 31 years old, Senna had reached the summit of the highest mountain that his sport had to offer three times over. He'd faced down the formidable Alan Prost and won his rightful place in racing legend. For most of us mortals, Senna's accomplishments are feats that we can only dream of. But by 1992, Senna had slipped a few positions in Formula One. A dude by the name of Michael Schumacher had entered the F1 scene, and everyone thought he was the hot wiener schnitzel. Alan Prost, Senna's greatest rival, was temporarily retired from Formula One, and Senna must have felt a little lost without him. Kind of like how Batman would have felt if the Joker had taken a sabbatical. I think that's a pretty apt analogy. <laughs> it's super apt. So I ask you, James, what do you do at that point? You hang out with Alfred the Butler. <laughs> There's no one else to hang out. He's with? a man no. before he's a butler, and he's a fam <laughs> close family friend. Really, the butler part is just you know for tax reasons. He's more of a mentor <laughs> and uh, a confidant, if you will. A steward. He's so much more than a butler. Nolan and you saying Alfred the Butler really says a lot about you and your views on uh, class. Of course, <laughs> Senna had always been competitive, and even without Prost, he still wanted to win. In 1992, his main foe was not a man, but machine, in the form of the technological marvel known as the Williams FW14B. The Joker had been replaced. With the Terminator. Dun, yeah, that, dun, 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 dun. That's a movie that I want to see. Dun, dun, dun. It, actually, dun, dun, you dun, could do dun, dun. Joker versus Terminator in the new Mortal Kombat. Both those guys are in it. What? Yeah, both yeah, the Joker. That's true. Uh -huh. How do you know that, James? I love watching Mortal Kombat videos. Like every time a new Mortal Kombat comes out, I watch all the fatalities. I think they're so creative. Oh cool. yeah. What would be uh, your he, fatality, James? Um. I'd probably like toot on you and then <laughs> okay. your face would melt off or act honestly oh, dude, or lightning. Like, like I'd lightning. Do a, I was gonna I'd summon lightning. lightning. Yeah. Or like the spirit of like a buff horse like yeah. emanates from you. I'd like, like a stampede of buff horses mm -hmm. kind of goes like tramples the opponent. That's pretty yeah. sick. I'd be like I'd be like Yeah. <laughs> and then all of a sudden like you'd hear like it's a really long fatality, like the rocks on the ground would start shaking. And then you just hear like yeah. this rumble and then the sky would fill with lightning. And then all of a sudden, just like this <laughs> herd, like runs you over. 
And then your bones get your bones get turned into dust, and then I snort them. <laughs> That's a long fatality. I snort them and go, "Mo pal, baby." Ah. <laughs> <laughs> That's so awesome. Yeah. <sighs> Nolan, what's your fatality? Oh, you know what? I get like you're, you're dazed, mm-hmm. and I come up to you, and I like spray some sort of rust. Um, Oh uh, yeah, oh, patina, a patina like, fatality. Yeah, 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 patinatality. Patinatality. So like, I spray like a rust, not inhibitor, but like an accelerant on you, and then you just turn into like a really rusty statue, and then I shove a, a an LS engine up your ass, mm-hmm. and uh, you're you're my new street rod, basically. Yeah. Like, oh, that's awesome. That's cool. <laughs> you know what mine is? Yeah, I was about to ask Joe. What's yours? So I I like. I slap a bass Mm -hmm. and that the like shock wave uh, breaks the person's bones and they turn into a little quarter pipe. (laughs) And then I take a skateboard and I run and I like do a blunt stall on their head and like crush their skull in. And then I kick flip back in and that's my fatality. That's a nar. (laughs) That's a nartality, dude. They should put us in Mortal Kombat, I think. Um, I think that's the next video game you guys are going to be yeah, in. Yeah, we're one, oh, we're allowed to say now. Uh, if you guys haven't heard, Nolan and I are uh, a pretty big part of the new Dirt Five video game made by Codemasters. We host a podcast called the pa- yeah. the um, called the Dirt Podcast by Donut Media in the game. So we're sort of like guiding you through the career mode. Um, we're pretty excited about it. It's pretty cool. It's available yeah, it's in October sick. on all. Uh, current gen and next gen consoles and as well as pc super happy for you guys Nailed i mean it, glad we got uh all the <laughs> podcast hosts on that video game. yeah when i was saying it out loud i was like why isn't joe on there <laughs> <laughs> no that's yeah. cool i'm i'm totally cool <laughs> next time next time yeah next time we yeah. host dirt six <laughs> yeah just as senna and prost had dominated on the track throughout the late 80s McLaren and Honda had also dominated the ever-evolving arm race of F1 engineering and design. However, Steve Nichols, the designer of McLaren's greatest cars, had left McLaren for Ferrari in 1990. Gordon Murray, McLaren's technical director, had retired from F1 altogether. After his 1991 championship, Senna also planned his own exit from McLaren for the Williams team, but Nobuhiku Kawamato, uh, Honda's president, intervened pleading pleading with senna to stay for another season senna who was loyal to the japanese company that had powered his f1 successes agreed however by 1992 japan fell into an economic recession and honda was forced to end their f1 program very unfortunate yeah that sucks With McLaren having lost so many of its key players, there was a major opening for other teams to step up and dominate the league. And it was Williams, the team that Senna declined to join because of his loyalty to Honda and McLaren, that filled the power vacuum with the creation of the FW14B. A refinement of the 1991 FW14, itself a high-performing model, the FW14B was one of the most technologically advanced cars in F1 history. It was powered by a 3.5 liter Renault V10, but more importantly, featured active suspension, traction control, a semi-automatic transmission, and anti-lock brakes. Many of these advances would soon be banned by the FIA, but for now, they gave the Williams car a distinct edge. For the first two races of 1992, Senna was still driving the McLaren car from the previous year. Nigel Mansell, racing for Williams, won both races handily. When McLaren's new car, the MP47A, was finally available for race number three in Brazil, it was no help to Senna. The MP47A's passive suspension could keep up with the two Williams cars on straightaways, but struggled mightily to keep up in the turns. In Senna's words, quote, In the race, I realized that Williams' cars were truly superior, and it was impossible to prevent Manzel from winning. I settled in behind them. However, on the fourth lap, I had engine trouble. It cut out suddenly in full straights at 250 kilometers an hour as if I had taken my foot off the gas. It was really dangerous to be driving under those conditions. In fifth gear and over a roughness of the track surface, the car would suddenly change course without me knowing where it was going. Therefore, I decided to retire from the race. Whoa. 
Damn. After the doubly painful exit, as Senna had been hoping to repeat his 1991 win at Interlagos, it also revealed the danger lurking behind the combination of a champion's mindset and an inferior car. The only way to compete for first without the best car was to push the machine beyond its limits. This catch-22 dynamic would later come back to haunt Senna in the 1994 season. One, very foreboding. But two, um, I, I, I'd want to do a, not a series, maybe a two-parter on Nigel Mansell in the future. Um, just because he, like, you look at pictures of him and he does not look like your typical F1 driver. Um, he, I wouldn't say he's a big boy, but he's a bigger boy mm -hmm. than Senna and Prost. Yeah. He's also got, he's got a that mustache. mustache. Yeah. Um, do you, do you think, uh, was it Lance Stroll? He seems like a really tall dude. He seems like six foot three or something. His dad's huge. Lance Stroll? Um, I'm not sure. I know Nico or Lawrence. Lawrence. You think you're so no, cool because you got a huge dad. Well, guess what? <laughs> <laughs> I know uh, Nico Hulkenberg, who unfortunately isn't driving anymore for in F1. He was yeah. pretty tall. I think he was the tallest of the F1 drivers. I think he was like 6'3", I think. That's how tall I am. Wow, that's pretty big. No, yeah, he's a tall boy. So you're saying there's a chance. There is a chance. <laughs> <clears throat> Tallest F1 driver ever is Hans Joachim Stuck. 6'4". Damn. Wow. Could have gone to the league. Yeah, his car was uh, a limousine. <laughs> <laughs> Not a very <laughs> tall car. <laughs> mm. <laughs> car was a limousine F1 car, and he sat in the back. <laughs> <laughs> nice. In the next race in Spain, the frustrations continued as Senna, once again straining beyond his car's capacity, spun out twice and again retired early. Off the track, Senna was critical of the state of Formula One. Quote, when you go into this sort of electronic war, you can find yourself completely stuck. No matter who you put in the car, the electronics will do the work, not the driver. Uh, that's kind of the thing with the, the the Williams of that time is that because it had traction control, because it had the self-leveling suspension, all these advancements, in a way, the car almost drove itself. I mean, obviously, you couldn't. I, I don't think you could. I hate when people that say car. that. I hate when people say that. Like the car does not drive itself. The car, we, you, me, and Joe probably couldn't even drive that car. Probably not. You know. Um, but yeah, oh my it, God, it does have a lot of advance, advancements it's, and advantages. I think one thing that kind of shows my, uh, me gaining maturity over the last couple of years, I remember in like college and like early on at Donut, um, I thought I was like a really great driver. You're, for you're some fast. Reason. You're fast. I'm, I'm like, okay for someone who like, doesn't drive <laughs> yeah very often mm -hmm. i'm okay i think i think i have like i will give myself credit i think i have natural instincts when it comes to driving but like there was a t like a few years ago i'll be like oh man dude throw me in anything i could drive it and that's just not true <laughs> that's not true you like have to practice yeah. these things i've been in quarantine for 13 weeks now uh my muscles have literally atrophied from sitting on the couch for so long <laughs> um, the phrase the car drives itself is like so relative to like maybe the 20 people mm -hmm. on the grid, you know, like, yeah, maybe in comparison to those guys, the car might drive itself, but like compared to anyone else in the world, like that's just not true. Right. This mm -hmm. just takes practice. Senna. Okay. Yeah. Okay, dude. It wasn't until the sixth race of the season that Senna found a way to compete. The race was held in Monaco, where Senna had previously dominated, winning the past three years in a row. Even here, though, Senna's technical disadvantage was clear. For the past four years in a row, he had taken pole position with the fastest qualifying lap. However, this year he qualified behind both Mansell and Patrese of Williams, more than a second off Mansell's pole position lap. And that is a long time, mm -hmm. especially around Monaco. For the first 70 of 78 laps, Mansell led the race, but then luck turned in Senna's favor as Mansell had a loose wheel nut and had to change tires. Senna took the lead, but Mansell surged behind him, almost immediately closing a seven-second gap to pull directly behind Senna. I mean, that just shows how fast yeah. that Williams was. Yeah. 
Mansell was so close behind that in Senna's word, he showed up in, quote, both of my rear view mirrors. However, <laughs> I mean, that's just right behind him. However, the tight streets of Monte Carlo essentially. <laughs> Hi, it's me, Nigel. I'm back. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> I just like to see like Senna look at both of his rear view mirrors at the same time with two different <laughs> eyes. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> the tight streets of Monte Carlo essentially required that Senna make an error for Mansell to have a passing opportunity. And Senna played flawless defense, taking his first win of the year in the inferior car. It was not the kind of racing that Senna was used to, like going from dancing a Brazilian samba to a Ven Viennese waltz. But he made it work. At the 1992 Belgian Grand Prix that year, Senna won the love of fans with an act of heroism that was more impressive than any win. During qualifying, Senna was driving behind Eric Comas of Renault. Comas spun off the track, careening into a barrier at almost 200 miles per hour. Comas was knocked unconscious, slumped over his wheel in the middle of the track. His foot stayed jammed on the throttle of his car, which had stayed on, and was screaming at 8,000 RPM as it pumped high octane fuel into the engine. Senna recognized the danger of the situation immediately, pulling over on the track as the other racers passed by. Fearlessly, Senna ran to the comatose Comas, killing the engine and holding Comas's head in place as the track attendants rushed over to help. Although Comas had no memory of the accident, he stated in a later interview that Ayrton Senna saved my life. It was an act of heroism and sportsmanship from Senna to Comas. One that would find an eerie mirror image in the tragic events of 1994. But that story will have to wait. I mean, stories like this that really just solidify Senna as this, you know, legendary character. And we've heard so many uh, instances of his, you know, drive to win and putting himself into danger. And even like other racers, like, quote unquote, into danger by like just taking that line or like going for that gap. But even though, you know, he's proven that winning is extremely important to him, he literally pulled out of the race to help a fellow racer. So, yeah, that's pretty honorable. Yeah, especially like that's not like there are people working at the track whose job that is. That's not his. That's not his job to do. You know, <laughs> not my job. Not my yeah. job. Um, I want to go to Spa. Blah, blah, blah. I, that's that's my number one track that I want to go to. Yeah. Um, one of the, the craziest things from that Williams documentary was uh, that Frank Williams ran the course before every race. That's like a long run to me. Yeah, yeah <laughs> especially know. at Spa, there's a lot of elevation changes. Just impressive, dude. I should you know? start jogging. I could see you jogging around like the ports of Long Beach. Yeah, like get to know like someone's name. Hey, yeah. Charlie, how's the baby doing? Oh, good, James. <laughs> <laughs> Did they dredge the canals yet? <laughs> <laughs> All right. The rest of the 1992 season was the story of two men, neither of whom were named Ayrton Senna. Nigel Mansell of Williams rode the FW14B to an impressive nine wins to take the F1 title. The German born Michael Schumacher of Benetton uh, placed third overall, showing exceptional promise and in Belgium, winning the first of what would eventually become 91 career wins. And I believe wow. the most, uh, I think he still has the most uh, championships of all time with, I believe, seven. In an interview from around this time, a calm and reflective Senna pondered his future. Quote, there is a great desire in me improving, getting better. That makes me happy. Every time I feel like I feel that I'm slowing down, my learning process is getting flat, it doesn't make me very happy. And that applies not only as a racing driver, but as a man. Of course, I have a lot more to learn as a man than as a racing driver. My career could not last many years. My life hopefully will still go for a long time. Happiness will come when I feel complete as a whole. In yeah, dude. In almost mystical terms, Senna seemed to be thinking of racing not in terms of winning or losing, but personal growth, which is pretty cool. Yeah. At the time, Senna yearned to grow to be a better man. Millions of people across the world, especially in his home country of Brazil, idolized Senna as he was. 
Sent his helmet emblazoned throughout his career with the green, yellow, and blue of his home country's flag, proclaimed his origins to a worldwide audience. In 1986, after his victory in Detroit, a Brazilian fan had run onto the racetrack to hand him a Brazilian flag, and it had become a tradition for Senna to wave one in his victory laps. And there were a lot of victory laps. A 2014 study found that Senna had 99% name recognition in Brazil and was more popular 20 years after his death than any current Brazilian athlete or celebrity. You know, 90 na- 99 name recognition in Brazil. Uh, I think that's higher than the Beatles had in Brazil. Beatles suck. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but they were bigger than Jesus. Yeah, Beatles uh. were bigger than Jesus. In other words, Senna had become a transcendent figure in racing and popular culture. So who better than Al- Alan Prost to bring him back to earth? In 1993... Ooh. Prost announced an unsurprising return to F1 after receiving a massive payment from Ferrari to stay away from other teams after he had left the Italian company on poor terms in 91. With the return of the professor also came Prost's notorious ability to use behind-the-scenes political posturing to gain an advantage on the track. The only thing I asked in the contract was that I don't want to be a teammate with Ayrton, explained Prost as he returned to racing. <laughs> While I doubt that Prost's contract was literally just a napkin with no Senna scrolled on it, his meaning was clear. Prost wanted to avoid the situation he had fallen into at McLaren, where Senna's popularity with both the team and Honda led to what the Frenchman saw as persistent favoritism towards Senna. Just because they didn't want to like tailor the car to Prost. Yeah. They're like, yeah, we're not going to like completely overhaul our program just so you have an edge over him. Prost's conditions were also much more significant than a bit of trash talking. The team he had signed with was Williams, whose car in 1993, the FW15C, again, the most technologically advanced car in the sport. Senna, who had passed up a spot on Williams in 1992 out of loyalty to Honda, was now shut out of the opportunity to join the team because of Prost icing him out. Also, as previously mentioned, Honda pulled out of F1 completely at the end of 1992, so the McLaren team had to settle for an underpowered Ford Cosworth V8 and a deal that wasn't even finalized by team manager Ron Dennis until December of 1992. So they had like three months to get that engine in the car, and I can't imagine that it was uh, very fruitful. But despite the technological mismatch, anticipation was incredibly high for the rekindling of the Senna Prost rivalry. The first race of the season was held in South Africa in what would turn out to be the last race or the last F1 race in Africa to date, with F1 still not having returned to the continent as of 2020. Uh, there actually has been talks, no, nah, not talks, but there's been, there's been some rumors about uh, going back. I think they should. In qualifying... Prost was less than a tenth of a second faster than Senna, and Michael Schumacher started in third. Senna took an early lead, choosing to race tactically and block Prost from passing. (laughs) Yeah, really tactically. (laughs) (laughs) By lap 30, Prost pushed past Senna on a straightaway. The two racers had wasted no time returning to their dueling ways. It was on sight. Uh, With Prost in the lead, his dominant car and engine took over, and by the final lap, the only driver Prost hadn't lapped was Senna. The next race was at Interlagos. Brazilians had not responded kindly to Prost's hostility towards their national hero, and a police escort was required for Prost's safety <laughs> ahead of the race. What a narc. In qualifying, the Williams Renault car superiority was crystal clear, just like my favorite Pepsi. Although Senna was famous for his first fast lap times, he qualified nearly two seconds behind Prost, as well as Damon Hill, the other Williams driver. Williams was at even more of a technical advantage in 93 than 92. As the race at Interlagos began, Prost took the early lead, and with Damon Hill close behind, it looked like the race could be headed for a predictable Williams 1-2 finish. But then, it started raining. The almighty equalizer of F1 racing. As long as the track was wet, the mechanical advantage of the Williams car was greatly reduced. Senna and many of the other drivers switched out for wet tires while Pross opted to stay on slicks. As the rain intensified, the race devolved into a demolition derby as multiple racers spun out and collided. On lap 30, Christian Fittipaldi, the nephew of famed Brazilian Emerson Fittipaldi, spun out and crashed into Pross, removing both drivers from the race. 
By the end of the race, 13 of 25 cars had retired, with eight of those due to some form of accident or collision. When sent across the finish line, he was not just the winner. He was also the last man standing. His car broke down only 50 meters after crossing the finish line, leading the euphoric Brazilian fans to flood the track and celebrate with their hero. It was a special moment, but nobody realized how special it truly was. It was the last time that Ayrton Senna would ever win on home soil. Wow. The next race was called, in classic 90s style, the Sega European Grand Prix. Uh, Yeah. That's that Sega. The European Grand Prix had been rebooted after going dormant from 1986 to 1992, and the creators of the fastest blue hedgehog on the planet were now F1 sponsors. The race, which rotated around various European tracks, was held that year at Donington Park in Britain, a track Senna was familiar with from his years in Formula Ford and Formula 3. It was also the track where Senna had first tested an F1 car with Williams 10 years prior. Just like Interlagos, the Williams drivers were 1-2 in qualifying, over one and a half seconds ahead of Schumacher and Senna in third and fourth positions, respectively. On race day, however, Senna would receive a blessing from the heavens. Again, just like at Interlagos, race day was rainy. Liquid equalizer was pouring down from the sky. The driver... <laughs> <laughs> I think that should be our, our canned water company, yeah. Donut Canned Water, yeah. Liquid Equalizer. Liquid equalizer. Hydration <laughs> is the great equalizer. <laughs> <laughs> the essence of water is moisture. Um, 36 ounce can. <laughs> <laughs> just like a big gallon aluminum can. Just the, the top is just enormous, but then you just have the regular. Like, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it, it, it weighs 15 pounds. Uh, it gets warm right away. <laughs> yeah, the, our promotional fridge holds one can. It's just like the shape of the can. <laughs> Hilarious. Okay, yeah. So as that liquid equalizer is pouring down from the sky, the drivers lined up for the start. And while fans always expected excitement from Senna, nobody was even remotely prepared for what would come next. It was a moment in racing history that would later be known simply as the lap of the gods. The starting light turned green. The race was underway. The conditions were wet but expected to dry out as the race continued, meaning Senna would have to take an early lead and a commanding lead at that in the rain if he wanted to hang on when the track got dry. Like time-traveling spaceships shooting out of a primordial Stonehenge fog, the cars accelerated past the blue and white Sega banners of the starting area, shooting up high plumes of water in their literal wakes. Prost started ahead of Schumacher on the right-hand side of the track along the racing line. On the left side, in second, was Damon Hill ahead of Senna starting in fourth. It seemed like the drivers might be settling in to maintain their starting positions going through the first turn, but Senna was pushed further to the left in the crowd of cars, veering all the way into the exit of the pit and even momentarily falling into fifth behind Carl Wendlinger. It looked like Senna was off to a slow start, But then the group entered the section of Donington known as the Craner Curves, and Senna made his first move. He stayed wide of the group, occupying the wetter part of the track that all the other drivers were trying to avoid. It was a gamble, but his grip held, and now Senna had plenty of empty track in front of him to pass. As Senna came out of turn three, he did exactly that, slingshotting past Schumacher and Wendlinger into third place, now behind only the two Williams drivers. Entering the old hairpin, the three cars temporarily lined up head to tail, but as they accelerated into the fifth turn, the section of the track known as Starkey's Bridge, Senna again turned up the aggression as his rivals thought only to stay on track. Senna looked like he was driving downhill while the rest of the field was on flat land. He cut inside on turn seven and forced himself past Damon Hill to take second place. About halfway around the track, Senna had already passed four drivers. In first place, Prost was probably simultaneously surprised and not surprised in the least to look back 
and see the Brazilian's red and white McLaren bearing down on him. As if to put an exclamation... Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, this is not good. Uh, uh, not good. <laughs> <laughs> as if to put an exclamation point on the dangerous conditions of the track that Senna was essentially ignoring, Michael Andretti, Senna's new teammate on McLaren, tangled with Wendlinger, spinning them both out in a sand pit next to the track and retiring both drivers before they had even completed a lap. Up in front... Senna stayed right on Prost's French derriere as the Williams driver maneuvered cautiously through the S-shaped turn nine. Prost was no fan of wet conditions. His plan was to drive defensively and wait for the rain to pass. This was not Senna's plan. Senna's acceleration on the ensuing straightaway showed a complete lack of fear, and he passed Prost on the inside to take the lead as he entered the final two hairpins leading up to the starting area. He'd gone from fifth to first in under two minutes in bad conditions by sheer force of will. It was truly the lap of the gods. Uh, if you guys have never seen this, uh, definitely take some time just to YouTube it. Um, it's really impressive. That's crazy. That's a lot of people that pass in one, one lap. Yeah, especially with the lesser car. As the race continued, Prost struggled with the shifting conditions and Senna was able to build his lead. He even showed off, taking fastest lap on lap 57 by taking a shortcut through the pit area. That's crazy. Senna had a perfect race day, finishing a full lap ahead of Prost. As a reward for this incredible achievement, Senna was presented with perhaps the greatest trophy of all time, a massive bronze statue of Sonic the Hedgehog standing atop a huge Sega logo. Uh, someone actually tweeted at McLaren a few years ago asking if they still had the trophy. And in response, they tweeted back a picture of it sitting on a shelf in what appeared to be a supply closet. Um, on behalf of Pass Gas, uh, I'm going to call you out, McLaren. I want you, to, I want you to display this piece of racing history in a suitably honorable setting up front in, in your lobby. In the lobby. In a case. In the lobby. Come on, come on, Zach Brown. We're calling you out, yeah, Zach come Brown. On, Zach. And if you um, guys I mean, don't want to display it, you can send it to Donut, and we will build a display case specifically for it <laughs> with lighting, suitable <laughs> lighting. Um, and a crystal stand yeah, for crystal. it. Crystal. The fanciest um, glass. I just, I just have to think that. <laughs> <laughs> I just have to imagine that Ron Dennis, Ron Dennis probably saw that trophy and he was like, "There's no <laughs> way we're putting that." Yeah. Up front. <laughs> I wonder if there's replicas. I want one. I, there has to be, dude. Hold on, let's let's check it out. Sega Trophy F1 replica. What the first result is the article the the 13 worst trophies ever seen on a formula. You know, podium. and that that proves. Like why we are the new generation of car yeah. culture. We don't mm -hmm. on anything, and especially cool stuff like a Sonic trophy. Donut is for the kids. Donut is for the people. It's not for a bunch of rich old white guys that like to shit <laughs> and stuff. So yeah. they like to claim yeah. stuff. Like yeah, you, you oh, the only reason you're in this position is because of me. Yeah, because you were a jerk to me, and guys like you were a jerk to me when I was 14 years old and going to car shows for the first time. And you called me the other F word when I asked you what, like, how a rotary worked. Uh, so we're <laughs> donuts for the kids. Donuts not for you. Thanks for watching our stuff, though. Thanks for the ad money. But come on, dude. That trophy kicks. <laughs> and Santa looks so yeah. happy holding it up. And there's a guy in the background who has a very big smile on his face. How could you not love this thing? Anyway. I hope everyone in the audience got a Dreamcast that day and logged on to that weird Fishman game. <laughs> <laughs> as a related bit of trivia senna himself had actually released his first video game with sega the previous year coincidence no such thing as coincidences entitled ayrton senna's super monaco gp2 that was his first game was <laughs> a uh, <the> sequel <laughs> um apparently senna was hands-on in the game's development designing two fantasy tracks for the game providing voiceover commenting on the tracks and even visiting sega while in japan for an hours long session with the developers. Back in reality though, Senna struggled to keep up with the superior Williams cars throughout the rest of the 1993 season. 
Not every race could be rainy. And in good weather, McLaren's tech simply could not match Prost's FW15C. It's tempting to imagine the what if of a 1993 season where Prost had allowed Senna to join him at Williams. But the story will have to wait for a pass gas episode set in an alternative universe where Nolan can dunk a basketball and and Joe is can bend steel rods with his with his arms like Jax from Mortal Kombat. And then I I have like the I'm like a centaur but the opposite. So I have a man's legs, but a horse's <laughs> upper half. <laughs> just like straight <laughs> arms with hooves. <laughs> Not practical no, at just... all. Like your back always hurts because you're a man just bent yeah, over. I'm like, <laughs> I can't even walk because my legs can't even support my horse torso. They won't let you in 7 Eleven because you're technically an animal head. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that would be the most inconvenient thing. Uh, in our actual universe, Nolan can barely make a layup. Joe has very weak arms. And, <laughs> and and the only horse part I have is my tail that I had removed when I was a baby. <laughs> All right. uh, but in the real world, Prost ended up easily winning the championship in 1993. The professor's brilliance, as always, was in his consistency, placing on the podium in 12 of 16 races and failing to finish only once. Senna would actually wow. win the last Grand Prix of the year in Australia with Prost in second, but as Prost reached up to Senna at the podium to shake his hand, Senna gripped Prost's hands and yanked him up to share the top spot on the podium. It was a great moment of sportsmanship that was especially poignant as Prost had announced his retirement from F1 earlier in the season. That's super yeah. nice. It was also, shockingly, the last time either man would ever stand on an F1 podium. With the season over, everyone now looked to 1994, the year when Senna's destiny, which had always seemed headed for driving greatness, would be interrupted by his tragic fate. The preseason saw Senna finally join the Williams team, more than a decade after he had first tested for them. It was an emotional goodbye, with Ron Dennis pleading with Senna to stay on McLaren. However, it was clearly past time for Senna to make a change, and he stayed firm. With Prost now retired and McLaren having lost Senna after six years of racing, the McLaren era of F1 dominance had officially come to an end. The yeah, you know, I was thinking about this last night. It's like the good times with the teams can't they can't last forever. Um, you know, six years and what is it, three championships, four championships? It's pretty awesome. Um I, like we're gonna see the same thing with Mercedes, I think, in a couple of years. They've just been dominating since 2014. Again, six years. They're probably gonna win this year. Um, but you know, there's rumors that Toto Wolf might leave the team. Um, and then the the your top driver goes to play for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Yeah, yeah. And then the second driver goes to play for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers as well. <laughs> so, oh, you guys don't watch football, okay? <laughs> Belichick, good coach, man. Yeah, did you? He's, I watched that Belichick Nick Saban. They made like a documentary because like they're like Belichick like mentored Saban, and like they're both really winning coaches. And it's just like a conversation between the two of them, and it is the most boring <laughs> thing I've ever yeah. seen in my whole life. It is so dull. Yeah, have you ever seen Belichick win? Like. The first thing he does is like shake someone's hand and then he like talks about what to do next season. Like he doesn't even Dude, I kinda love that. It's just though. like another another notch on the bedpost for him. That's not how I like <laughs> I I I love giving a good fist pump whenever I accomplish something trivial. Like uh I've been practicing manuals on my BMX bike. Dude, that's so but, like, sick. Why didn't you open the episode with that, Nolan? <laughs> we could have been referring but, to you doing manuals. God, Nolan, there's something, there's something <laughs> admirable, I guess, or just like, I just love that just the ruthless competitive spirit of Bill, Bill Belichick, not even smiling when they win, you know, like it's, yeah. it's, so, it's kind of iconic. The sport was changing in other ways in 1994. Major rule changes had come into effect with technological advances having become increasingly decisive in giving certain teams, namely Williamson or <laughs> namely Williams, huge advantages, the FIA banned pretty much everything that had made the 1992 and 93 cars so superior, namely active suspension, traction control, and ABS. 
Although Senna had advocated for these changes, he criticized the FIA for how they were implemented. Quote, the cars are immediately less stable, remarked Senna. And quote, as a consequence, they are harder to drive and will have more cars spinning out and going off the track. The problem with the changes was that they removed technical assistance without changing the speed capabilities of the cars, essentially guaranteeing that races would be more dangerous. The entire beginning of that season now feels like an awful foreshadowing of the tragedy that was to come. In the first race of the year at Interlago, Senna and his Williams teammate Damon Hill both spun out in practice. I can't explain it, remarked Senna. It looks silly and stupid, but better it happens today than tomorrow. However, the next day was no better. Senna's car was visibly skidding and jumping on the track. Apparently, the Williams team had not yet optimized the tuning of their new car, the FW16. As Senna tried to catch up with the leader, Michael Schumacher, again with Bennington for the 94 season, his tires had become worn out by the constant skidding. Just as in practice, Senna spun out on lap 56, forcing him to retire from the race. In retrospect, the problem with the Williams car of that year was that it had been designed as an evolution of the FW15C, the previous year's technological marvel that had allowed Prost to dominate. The FW15C aerodynamics were built to complement its high-tech features, especially traction control. With those electronic aids now banned, the design team failed to properly adjust the car to F1's new reality. After two years of developing the most high-tech cars in the sport, the Williams team was now struggling to put together a functional passive suspension car. The next race, held in Japan, only worsened Senna's frustrations. After edging out Schumacher for pole position in qualifying, Mika Hakkinen ran into Senna on the first corner of the race, ending his day after only two seconds on the track. By then, Damn. Senna had become paranoid that other cars were using banned electronic aid. Instead of returning to the pit, Senna stood by the track and listened to the cars as they passed, trying to pick up any telltale sounds of traction control. The third race of the year was the San Marino Grand Prix. Senna was approaching the race as a reboot of the season in which he had failed to finish in two races. He had won three times before at Amola and was visibly tense before the race. The Williams team had been making constant adjustments to their vehicle, but things weren't getting better. The car is worse, Senna told his team after taking practice laps. Did Senna just pass your house, Nolan? Yes. <laughs> he explained that he was suffering from both oversteer and understeer at different points in the track, which I can imagine is very frustrating. It's like that It's like that um, three-wheeled car that we had a couple years ago. That's <laughs> the Polaris. The over, yeah, the, the slingshot. It's a really fun car to drive around. It's just like total attention getter but i thought it would be more fun than it was um like i thought it, i was like man this thing's kind of dumb this will be fun to cruise around so i put on um rough riders <laughs> anthem one day and uh <laughs> <laughs> was driving around and like i realized and i put on some heat waves some like real fast looking sunglasses and i realized um about 30 <laughs> minutes into it that no one else knew i was joking and i was just <laughs> a guy with like bleach blonde hair and fast sunglasses in a player slingshot bumping rough riders anthem and everyone's just like you're a dork <laughs> yeah <laughs> the point being though like i took it i went on a pretty aggressive canyon day with it and uh it was a lot of oversteer and understeer at the same time which is very strange to feel Aggre just, it's exactly Scary. like the the williams that was your first press car huh nolan that was the that was the only car that I got to review on the uh, the the donut new car show. Uh, yeah. um, it was yeah. a good, really good review yeah. too. I yeah, I was so. pretty stoked. We should bring that back. Other teams were also struggling with the rule changes. What had so far amounted to unease and discomfort descended into violence at the qualifying sessions on the Friday of the racing weekend. Rubens Barrichello. Barrichello? Rubens Barrichello, racing for the Jordan team, hit a curb at 140 miles an hour, sending him flying into a tire barrier and knocking him unconscious. Senna watched in horror on a television screen in the Williams pit. Barrichello had serious injuries, but he escaped alive, although he was out for the weekend. On the second day of qualifying, the situation became much, much worse. Roland Ratzenberger, an Austrian driver who at the age of 33 had only just realized his dream of making it to F1 that very season, uh, his front wing snapped off, causing the car to lose downforce as he sped down a straightaway 
leading into the Vilner corner. He hit the wall at 195 miles per hour. Again, Senna would watch on television as medics raced in vain to save Ratzenberger's life. The crash was too serious. The Austrian succumbed to his injuries. He was the first F1 racer to die during a Grand Prix since 1982. Senna cried as he heard the news. It was unclear whether he would decide to continue and compete in the race. On the morning of race day, Senna spoke to his former rival Prost, suggesting that the drivers bring back the Grand Prix Drivers Association, or GPDA. The GBDA had been disbanded for political reasons in the 80s, but had formerly advocated for higher safety standards on behalf of F1 drivers. Prost recalled, I was very surprised as normally he did not even say hello if I crossed his path. At the driver's briefing, Senna criticized the condition of the racetrack. He offered to lead the reform GPDA as he was now the most senior driver in F1. Senna, now 34, was no longer fearless. That weekend, he had directly witnessed the dangers involved in F1, and he openly acknowledged that he feared those risks. However, he was not about to back down. It was probably never in doubt that Senna would race that weekend at Amola, even after Barrichello crashed, even after Ratzenberger died. Senna strapped into his F1 car for the last time. He started fast, taking the lead over Michael Schumacher and the rest of the field. At the beginning of the sixth lap at the Tamburello corner, Senna's car flew off the track at 191 miles per hour as he failed to make the turn. Although Senna veered his car to try and avoid impact, it was too late. He crashed into the wall with devastating force. His car's front suspension was forced backwards, striking him in the head. The car's two right wheels blew off and fragments of his car flew high into the air, covering the track in wreckage. The crushed remains of the car skidded to a stop with Senna slumped in his driver's seat. Although he was airlifted to a hospital and the race continued, Ayrton Senna had died on impact. It was May 1st, 1994. That's like if Michael Jordan died during a game. During the flu game. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that's pretty <laughs> sad. Yeah, but this isn't the image that we want to leave you with. Instead of dwelling on that terrible day, imagine time moving in reverse. Senna, the sportsman of 93, realizing the value of his rivalry with Prost. His six magical years at McLaren, winning three championships and delivering one thrilling racing highlight after another. His Formula Ford and F3 years in Britain, amazing fans with his pure potential. At 21, the decision to move away from his family in Brazil to realize his racing dreams. As a young teenager racing carts, the innocent joy of speeding around the track, untainted by the politics and incredible pressure of F1. At the age of seven, learning to drive on his family's Jeep, happy days with his family, daydreaming in class about one day being a famous Formula One driver. Back then, he was just Ayrton. In 1994, Senna's body made a similar journey home, returning to the streets of Sao Paulo. The same narrow avenues that had played host to his first kart races held on the street. Millions of Brazilians emerged from their home to say goodbye to their hero. As Senna's body lay in state at the Legislative Assembly Building, 200,000 people lined up to pay their respects. At Senna's funeral, Prost himself was a pallbearer. Senna continues to be a national icon in Brazil, with his gravesite, according to the Daily Telegraph, receiving more visitors than the graves of JFK, Marilyn Monroe, and Elvis Presley combined. His epitaph reads, quote, Nothing can separate me from the love of God. The other F1 drivers would realize Senna's vision of reinstating the GPDA, with Michael Schumacher leading the group from 1994 until 2005. Major safety improvements were made to F1, including redesigned tracks and reduced engine output. We all go back to where we began eventually. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. The earth travels around the sun, another year goes by. A racetrack works the same way, around and around, only to return to the same spot. It's what you make of the journey that gives these cycles meaning. What did you accomplish? More, more importantly, how did you grow and change before returning to where you started? For Senna, it was three F1 titles, 65 pole positions, and 41 wins in 161 starts. It was winning the love of millions of fans around the world. 
It was the sun on his face as he took a joyful lap around the track. It was taking a name and making it synonymous with greatness. Senna. Dun, 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 dun. Damn, dude. Heavy. Really heavy. But awesome. Like, such a... Yeah. I really agree with that, like, growing and changing before you return sentiment. Yeah. That's That's huge. I love that. Um, You know, before... I mean, before we start of the series i've been watching f1 not super long compared to a lot of other fans and as a result i i kind of have a a different view of the sport um i've been watching it since 2014 and you know i saw the senna documentary when it came out and was like oh man i should watch f1 sometime but had hadn't really dived too much deeper into the life of senna it's because he's almost like he's so mythic that it's almost like a given in that way you know like if you didn't watch him or you didn't grow up with like fans of the sport. Like my dad didn't watch F1, so I never really heard about Senna at all. Uh, you kind of just take his presence as like, yeah, he was like a really great driver and people really love him. Uh, but now I kind of see why, you know, but it's just that pure relentless spirit that I think really yeah. is and he was, so attractive. And I think he, him. he had a lot of integrity too. Like, more more than a lot of other drivers and the fact that he's just willing to jump out of his car and that says volumes about him yeah he was just like the complete package for a legend like he was you know the best ever but also a good human you know he had uh a real connection to like his home and therefore became like a national hero um and then he was you know taken away before he could like enact change yeah i mean he was just like he was taken away at the height you know like yeah yeah we didn't watch him get old yeah even even with his death he pushed everything in motion to make things safer and did what he was trying to do in that last season bring attention to the lack of safety well, we've been covering a lot of really heavy stuff on this show. Um, next week, we're going to take a little break from crying um, and people <laughs> dying. Uh, and we're going to, you know, kind of do a silly subject. Um, Nolan, you want to tell everybody what that is? Yeah. So next week is the story of one Mr. Duncan Hamilton. Uh, as far as I can tell, the only man to win Lamar drunk. He has a very interesting life story, if you can imagine. Um, so I'm pretty excited to to tell that one. It should be a lot more lighthearted. And it's just a it's just a bunch of it's a barrel of laughs. It's a bunch of goofs and gags. Um <laughs> a lot of hijinks, <laughs> yeah. a lot of uh there's a, a brouhaha a few times. It's just it's a Any it's a lot of guffaws. Guffaw there oh definite guffaws. Yeah. Um a lot of Some yucks. Farces. Multiple Some farces. farces. Multiple farces, a lot of yucks. <laughs> um yeah it should be <laughs> <laughs> thank you guys so much for listening to the past guys podcast um if you don't already subscribe to uh us on a streaming service we also have a youtube channel called donut podcasts and then a youtube channel just called donut media go ahead and subscribe all to all those uh it really our secondary channel donut media. <laughs> yeah. uh it really really helps us out that's kind of like how we know that we're doing a good job uh if you want to rep the set get yourself some merch you can go to donutmedia.com we got some pretty cool shirts uh i think the wheelhouse shirt is out by now um it's pretty cool pretty metal i'm so yeah. pumped on it can't wait to get mine uh follow nolan across social media at nolan j sykes especially on twitter follow joe at joe g weber uh on all socials and then follow me at james pumphrey uh i love you yeah be kind see you next time fired up